right? We have, we're always waiting for the weekend. We're always waiting for the next vacation or, you know, thank God it's Friday, waiting for the, for Friday. Um, and Mondays have a bad rap because you're just getting into it. And there's like this paradox, I guess, because we, do we work to vacation or do we vacation to work? You know, if we, if not for work, then vacation would be kind of meaningless because our whole life would just be one long vacation. So it wouldn't really have value. So work gives the vacation value, but are we working just to vacation or just to take it easy? Um, so this lesson is gonna um, explore the religious and the Torah perspective on work um, and how we can make that something meaningful and purposeful in our life. So I was thinking to share a video. Um, let me see if I can share my screen and if this will be a simple, yeah, perfect. So I was thinking to share this video because I thought it was really um, impactful. When I watched it, I, um, it made me think a lot about what does the Torah believe in um, when it comes to the idea of retirement or, you know, vacation, taking it easy, you know, sitting back and doing nothing. Maybe there's value in that, you know, maybe that would give a person more time to, um, you know, dedicate to prayer or to serving God or to learning Torah um, or doing good deeds. So maybe the Torah wants us to, um, you know, just spend time focusing on our, on our own personal growth and on our um, our Judaism or other areas of our life. So this is a short clip. Um, it's of the Rebbe talking to somebody. Um, and the man asks the Rebbe a really powerful question. And I guess we'll see what the Rebbe answers and then we can discuss it after. I hope everyone can see my screen. Yeah. Jane, I guess Jane, do you see my screen? I see, I see the flyer. I see the show flyer with you your mail. Oh, whoops. No worries. Okay, if you want to send it to me to share, I'm happy to. I think I'll, let me try one more time. You see, does everyone see yep. it? Yep, yep. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> this is Brother Benjamin. When does one decide if one has enough? You don't know We sold out our business. Yeah. We have an offer now that they want. If we want to sell it back to us, if we want. I'm trying to understand. When does one feel he has enough for him and his family? If you have experience in business, it, you must use it. If it is better to use it in the same business or only the new business, it depends on the conditions of the market. And it depends on the character of the person. Someone is more happy to continue in the same vein. Someone is more happy and more successful when he is trying to, to open a new trade. So you have to continue doing what you know best. Yeah, but you are more happy. I must think that you know that it depends on the character. Someone is more happy than he is trying to try to make a new trade. And when you have enough or you feel there's enough for you and you have reached your goal? That is not possible for the Jew because he has an endless lesson. Okay, and, and, okay. Stop from God of my so I guess we can talk about this a little bit. I thought it was really powerful because, um, you know, you, what you would expect from a Rebbe or from a religious leader is perhaps, you know, someone's asking a question about business. Should I go back into business? Maybe the religious leader would, you know, you would assume would maybe say, no, don't go into business. Dedicate your time to Torah learning or dedicate your time to, um, you know, just doing acts of goodness and kindness. Um, but the Rebbe specifically says, if you have a, if you have experience and success in business, then you should go back into business. Um, and he says, according to what you are good at, according to your character, 
But if you have experience in something and you have a talent in something, then you should do it. That's pretty much what the Rebbe says to him. Um, any other thoughts from watching that video? Did that bring up any ideas for anyone? Um, Cause this is gonna segue into the idea, you know, what is the Jewish perspective on work and business and being involved in the work in the workforce? So any, did that video bring up any comments for anyone, any ideas to share? Jane? Yeah, uh, can you hear me? I can, yeah. Okay, because you're very faint on my end. Um, I think all that is well and good, but in life, you don't want to keep doing the same thing uh, because you grow by experimenting and going out in the world and failure is part of growth. And I feel if somebody has been that successful, yes, keep their business, keep what they're doing well. But again, to have a percentage to go out and say, let's try this. Let's do this. Now that I have learned this and I'm so good at it, I want to use it further and fan out. Yeah, that's a great point. And I think what the Rebbe tells the man is not necessarily do you have to go back into the business that you were in before, right? He says, he says you don't necessarily have to right. go back in old business, but if you have a skill, then you should put it to use, basically. Um, that's what I took from the video, that... You know, you can try different business ventures. You could try something new um, according to what interests you. But if you have a talent, if you have a skill, then you should be putting it to use. You shouldn't be letting it sit dormant. Thanks, Jane. That's a good point. So, you know, we're going to understand on a deeper level why the Rebbe had this perspective. Um, but just to start off, there's a quote from the book of Eob, the book of Job where it says that man was born to toil, meaning that not only were we given this ability to toil, to work hard, but we were actually born to toil, which means that it's almost like our purpose of existence. Like part of our reason for being in this world is to toil, to work hard. And another example of this in the Torah is every Shabbat, we say the Kiddush, right? We say um, the blessing over the wine before we eat. And in the text of the Kiddush, it says, six days you shall work and on the seventh day you shall rest and this is the verse from the torah that describes to us the shabbat that on for six days monday to friday we work and on the seventh day saturday we rest and it's interesting that the pasuk the verse specifically says six days you shall work it doesn't just say you know six days do whatever you want <laughs> and then on the seventh day you're commanded to keep shabbat because really we think that the Torah is mainly commanding us to keep Shabbat. So it doesn't really matter what we do on the six days, or does it? <laughs> but really, if the Torah is just telling us to keep Shabbat, then it doesn't really need to command us to work. It doesn't have to say six days you shall work. But that's exactly what the Torah says. Um, it says that we shall work for six days, and then on the seventh day we should rest. And so what this is telling us is that part of the command to rest on Shabbat is really to work the first six days, because if we think about it, the purpose of Shabbat, I think we spoke about this um, in a past lesson, that the purpose of Shabbat is to recalibrate ourselves and get ready for the upcoming week. And so everything that we're going to be doing in the upcoming week is like, you know, reflected on over the 24 hours of Shabbat, where we have time to uh, reflect and um, it's a time of introspection and connection with our family and with God. And so part of that is working over the first six days of the week, because if you're not being productive during the other six days of the week, then what's Shabbat for, you know? So it's, it goes hand in hand. Not only is the Torah telling us to celebrate Shabbat, it's also telling us to work for the first six days of the week. So we see that, you know, from the Rebbe's answer to this man and from this verse from the Torah, that work has an inherent value in the Torah. It's not just something that we do to keep ourselves occupied or to make a living, or it is all those things. You know, we need work to support ourselves, support our families, um, to, you know, pursue something in our life. But it also, according to the Torah, we see has some intrinsic value, um, actual spiritual value. Even. Um, and that's what we're going to be delving into today. So, there's an interesting, um, there's an interesting um, 
discussion in the Talmud, where the Talmud, the Gemara, it says that when a person passes on to the next world and a soul comes up to heaven, it says that the soul is asked four questions. What are these four questions? Well, the first one is the soul is asked, according to the Talmud, the soul is asked, did you deal honestly in business? And the second one is, did you set times to learn Torah? Um, the third one is, did you um, have children or did you pursue having children? And the fourth one is, did you await the final redemption? Did you wait the coming of the Messiah? And, you know, this, all four of these are definitely important values in Torah, right? We, um, Torah learning is, the Torah is like the bedrock of who we are as a people, where the people of the book, it's our guide in life. It's our blueprint for life. Um, so that's, of course, a huge value for us. Um, having children is Lador Vador. That's also one of the main pillars of Judaism, passing on to the next generation. Um, you know, that's huge. Um, and awaiting the redemption. That's one of the Rambam's 13 principles of faith. That part of our, one of our principles of faith as Jews is that we believe in the coming of the Messiah. We believe in a time where the world is going to be filled with peace and godliness. And it's going to be a place where we can see goodness in a revealed way. That's something that, you know, we believe in. Um, but what about the first one? And why is it first? Did you deal honestly in business? It seems a little bit out of place, not to say that business, being honest in business isn't important. It's hugely important. But why does it come before all the other big values of Torah learning, of having children, passing on to the next generation, um, and, you know, believing in the redemption? Why is the first question that the soul asked, according to the Talmud, um, did you deal honestly in business? Um, so we're going to explore this answer, but just some food for thought. Um, does anyone have any ideas that come to mind? It's okay if not, but Jane. Um, I, I believe it's because one of the reasons is because it takes business. If you go to business, it takes up a very big portion of your day, your life and your energy. And I think everything points um, in, in your soul on how you conduct yourself as a person uh, to other people and with other people. Uh, so not only does it take up eight hours and more of your day, but that's very important because it's how you spend your life and how you direct it uh, to working with people around you and to be honest with what you do. If you're honest, if you're not honest, then you're wasting a lot of energy and you're going to go to jail. <laughs> That's a really great point, Jane, that, you know, business takes up such, or work in general, takes up so many, just time-wise, it takes up right. time. Yeah, that's a great point, for sure. Um, thanks, Jane, for sharing. I love hearing you. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's exactly, we're going to touch on that. That's a really great point. But as we know, you know, in work, there are other problems that can arise. People deal with, you know, some of the problems that come up with work are, of course, this, the idea of integrity, that it's a place where our integrity and our honesty is tested, um, both in dealing with other people, dealing with money. Um, it's just a place where, you know, we have to step up to the plate and be honest people, with, you know, live our lives with integrity. And it's really a, a time and a place where our, our values are put to test, our integrity is put to test, especially for someone in business, I would assume. I would imagine. Um, but another big problem that I guess a lot of people face is the idea of priorities, right? Sometimes work becomes the number one priority just because it's so urgent. A lot of times work can be um, urgent, but not important, right? So there are things in life that are important, but not urgent. So that would be like spending time with family, spending time with friends. Those things are important, but they're not always urgent. Um, work is something that's usually very urgent. And so it always, not always, but if, if we lose track of our priorities, it can easily become um, something that takes precedence over everything else. Um, and so a lot of people have this struggle with, you know, prioritizing what comes first, my family or my work, or, 
you know, my self care or my work. Um, so that's another struggle that a lot of people face when it comes to work. Where do you draw the line? What, at one point is, you know, something else more important? Or at one point, do you need to step away and um, focus on other areas of importance in your life? Um, and of course, another idea is when it, with success, a lot of times can come arrogance. If somebody is making a lot of money or is very successful in their work, um, that can lead somebody to arrogance. And so we see the flip side, I guess, of this idea of business or work is that, you know, there are some dangers as well that we have to be cautious of, um, like, you know, maintaining our priorities, maintaining our integrity and um, maintaining humility. So there's definitely both sides. Um, but I think just to touch on what you were saying before, Jane, that the, a basic belief in Judaism is that God runs the world, right? And every single detail of our lives is dictated by God. And even though it may feel like, you know, I don't see God or I don't feel him in every detail. In reality, we believe that every single, every single detail of the world, every single detail of our lives is being um, dictated by God. And so um, there's this concept that God determines how much money a person is going to make and how successful a person is going to be. And we have to do our part, of course, but at the end of the day, God is the one who determines um, who is going to make it, who's going to make a lot of money, who's going to make, you know, not as much. It's all really determined by God. And if somebody really internalizes this idea, it's a very powerful um, way to live because it takes away the rat race or, you know, the temptation to cheat or to steal or to be dishonest, because at the end of the day, God is the one who determines the outcome. God is the one who determines how much I'm going to make, how successful I'm going to be. And so um, if somebody really believes this, truly believes it, not just in theory, not just as a nice idea, like, yes, God runs the world. But if really we truly take this idea to heart and say, I really believe that every aspect of my life is determined by God. And therefore there's no purpose or no, obviously it's, it's wrong to, to be dishonest, but like, there's no value in it at all. It's not even going to work because at the end of the day, God is the one who determines um, how successful somebody is going to be. And so like you were saying before, Jane, the workplace is really a testing ground for our belief in God. And it's also a testing ground for our um, honesty and our value as human beings, because it's a place where we get to put these ideas to test. It's all of these ideas, when you're learning Torah, when you're in a Torah class, it's nice to talk about these ideas and it's important to. And, you know, you can read books and, and um, say like, you know, I believe in God and I believe that God is part of my life. And that's so beautiful and that's so important. But when we actually engage with the world and when we actually interact with the people in our life and we go to work and we deal with, have business dealings and have to deal with these different challenges, that's when our beliefs are actually put to the test, right? It's easy to say, I love everybody. You know, I love all mankind. That's easy. But to actually, you know, do a favor for your coworker or be there for somebody that needs it, that's, that's a little bit more challenging, you know? And so somebody who acts dishonestly, somebody who doesn't have integrity is actually, um, it's more than just a dishonest person. It's a lack of faith in God because it's saying that I think that I can manipulate how much money I'm going to make, or I can um, cheat my way into being successful. Meanwhile, at the end of the day, God is the one who determines everything. And so specifically at work, specifically interacting with the world is when our belief and our um, like our sh our strength as human beings is put to the test um, and can be proven in either way. Um, so that's you know religious people who succumb to different you know you hear these stories that are or not just religious people anyone who succumbs to these the temptation to cheat or lie or steal it means that they really didn't internalize their belief in God. Their belief in God was never 
genuine to begin with, because um, if it doesn't manifest itself in the details of your life, in your workplace, then it can't really, it was never genuine in the first place. It was a theory, but it wasn't um, brought down into practicality. Um, so to answer the question of, you know, why is dealing, being honest in your business dealings, the first question that the soul is asked, um, based on this, I think the answer is pretty clear that, you know, studying Torah and having children and believing in the redemption are all beautiful values. And they are all so, so important not to minimize them at all. But when are these values actually put to the test? When are these values actually challenged in business, right? Did you deal honestly in your business? Were you, did you have integrity? Did you deal with other people in an honest way? that's when these values are actually put to test. And that's why the soul is asked this question first, because all of the other values are important and they're so, you know, they're big, important values in Judaism, but they're all theory unless they were actually put into practice. And where would, where would they have been put into practice in your everyday life, in your business dealings, in your honesty and in your interactions with other people. That's really when these values get put to test and, that's, you know, one of the reasons why it's the first question that the soul is asked when it ascends up to heaven. Um, there's another idea that I think expresses the inherent value in working. Um, because we spoke about how work, you know, brings out the, how genuine we are in our belief in God and in our commitment to being honest and good people. But you know, there's an actual inherent value in work on its own. Um, and this idea is that human beings were created with the, almost the need to produce, right? The Talmud says that a person would rather one measure of their own than nine measures of their fellows. What does this mean? That when something is produced by us, when we create something with our own talents, with our own skills, with our own abilities, it actually brings out a different, um, you know, like a different pride and joy. And it's like an expression of ourselves. Somebody who's into art, I'm sure can relate to this idea that when you create a masterpiece, even if, you know, somebody else created something, you know, more exquisite or more expensive, whatever it is, it doesn't make a difference because your work of art has a different meaning to you. It really holds such a deep personal part of yourself. And therefore it is the most valuable thing that you have. Maybe something that you created on your own is so much more valuable than something that someone else gave to you or provided you. And this is, you know, the idea in Hasidut that God created an imperfect world, right? God gave us the raw materials. He gave us, um, you know, the, the wheat and we have to create the bread. And God didn't create the world perfect. He didn't create both physically and both spiritually, actually, in a, in a physical sense, like God literally gave us raw material and he left it up to mankind to develop the world and to use our innovation and our, our minds to develop the universe. Um, and also in a spiritual sense, right? God didn't create us as perfect human beings. He didn't create us as these angels that always do the right thing. He created us imperfect. And the reason for this, both physically and spiritually, is that he wanted us to achieve things with our own efforts, with our own abilities and our own talents. And this applies both physically and spiritually. Like I said, you know, God gave mankind the opportunity to be inventors, to be creators, to be um, innovators. And if God had created the world already perfect, you know, we wouldn't have that opportunity to give to each other, to give to others, to use our minds to come up with um, new ideas and new possibilities. Um, and it wouldn't be the same, you know, if the world was created perfect and we had everything handed to us on a silver platter, it wouldn't be as meaningful to us. It would be almost shallow because, you know, we're just takers part of man, human nature is to be a giver. We're not comfortable being only takers. It's actually an uncomfortable feeling to only be a taker, to be someone who's always being provided for. 
um, it like becomes uncomfortable almost. A person naturally wants to be a giver and wants to, um, you know, you want to have something that you can provide for others. It's like a natural um, desire that we have. And so God knows this and he gave us that opportunity. He said, I'm going to create an imperfect world where you have endless opportunities to um, create new things. Um, and that's why, you know, when we invest ourselves, when we create something new, we invest ourselves in it. And it like takes on a whole new life because it, it's so meaningful to us. It's so important because we created it. Cheryl, do you have something to add? <laughs> I guess I guess that's why grandparents are always wanting to be giving to their grandchildren all the time. And, you mm. know, when we're having any kind of festive meal or we're going someplace, you know, I I kind of feel like if if I bake something or I make, you know, cook something that, you know, I'm really giving from my heart. And I really think that's, you know, that enters into it as well you know, the ability to, to be, to be giving and Sadaka, you know, whether you give $1 or you give $1 million, you know, it, you're giving, you're giving. Yeah. And I think that's so important to be, have the ability to give whatever it might be, whether it be money or physical. That's so beautiful, Cheryl. Thanks for sharing. And it's so true. I'm happy you brought that up because we actually discussed this in a previous class when we did talk about Sedaka. We said one of the reasons why God created some people poor and some people rich, right? We discussed how we said, why did God not create us all equal? Why didn't God give each person exactly what they need? Um, and that solves the problem. Why do we need to have different classes? Why do we need to have people that are needy and other people that have way more than they need. And God created this imbalance on purpose. We said, because he wants us to be givers, he wants us to be able to pursue kindness. And if everyone had what they needed given to them, um, there would be no possibility for that kindness. The idea of kindness would not exist because if I have nothing to give to you and you have nothing to give to me, then we don't need each other, right? God created a world where we need one another. We need, um, to use our abilities to create new things and to give to one another. That's a beautiful point. Thank you, Cheryl, for bringing that up because it really ties into that lesson that we spoke about where we spoke about Sedaka exactly. Um, and so one of the reasons that the Lubavitch Rebbe explained something so beautiful that one of the reasons why God created the world this way or created human nature this way that we need to be productive, we need to be producers, we need to be innovators, um, is because God created man in the image of God. We are created in God's image. And therefore, we strive to be, you know, godly beings. And we know that the ultimate creator is God, right? God created the world. And God is the ultimate giver. So God is both the ultimate creator, because he put, brought everything into existence. And God is also the ultimate giver because all the blessings and all of the things that we have in our life are provided by God. And so the reason why we have this deep essential need to be givers and to be creators is because we are created in the image of God. Because God is a creator and God is a giver, we as human beings who are created in his image um, have this natural desire to be godly and to be I mean, I don't know if I could say similar to God, but yeah, we want to mimic God in any way that we possibly can, even in our limited human way. Um, and so when we do create new things and when we do take our, ta our God-given talents and our abilities and we use it um, to make a difference in this world and to bring, you know, bring everything that we have to the table and provide for others, um, that kind of makes us a partner in creation with God because God created this imperfect world and he leaves it up to us to perfect it in any way that we can. And so um, this is really the idea of not just why God created us, created an imperfect world, but why God created us this way. Why did God create human nature in a way that we need to, we have this desire to give to others and we're not complacent just living a selfish life, right? Animals can go their entire lifetime 
you know, searching for food and searching for shelter and just fulfilling their own needs and the needs of, you know, like their animalistic needs. And that's fine. That's how animals were created. They don't strive for anything higher. But man was created in a way that living life just pursuing your own needs is not enough for us. It's not, it wouldn't be, we wouldn't be content with that. We wouldn't be complacent. Um, it would actually be like a meaningless existence if we lived that way. And we have this natural need and desire to give back and to give to others and to create new things. Um, I think I, a practical example of this is, you know, sorry to bring up COVID, but a lot of people during quarantine, they were, you know, home, um, out of work, and it brought up a lot of mental health issues because that's not how man was created to be. We're not meant to be locked up and just eating, sleeping, waking up, uh, going to the supermarket, not interacting with other people, you know, not producing anything new, not going to work and providing for others. That kind of existence is really, really bothersome for us. It's really troubling. It's not the way we were meant to function. And I think that could be one of the reasons why people had struggled with quarantine so much because it's, it's, it was hard to give back. It was hard to, um, you know, most people weren't able to go to work and um, do that in their life during quarantine. And it brought up a lot of other issues because it goes against our nature. It goes against um, how we were meant to be in this world. Um, sorry to bring up quarantine and COVID as an example, but I think it just fits so perfectly. Um, it's such a practical example of how this plays out in our life. Um, yeah, so if I, of course, if anyone has any questions or comments, I would love to hear. But Judaism actually gives two practical um, ways to stay focused on this point, right? These ideas are really important, but how do we actually implement them into our work life, right? Sometimes you go to work and you get caught in a rut and it becomes tiring and exhausting and you lose focus of, you know, I'm here because I want to give and I want to create and I want to um, you know, live a meaningful and purposeful life. And how do we keep that in mind? How do we really keep that at the center of everything that we do in work um, and in our, in our work week? Um, so two examples that Judaism, practical examples that Judaism gives us. The first one is Shabbat, which we spoke about briefly, that without the work week, Shabbat doesn't have its value really, because the whole purpose of Shabbat is that we detach momentarily from the work week in order to go back into the next week with a new rejuvenation and a new um, energy and more focus. Really, that's what Shabbat is all about. It's about um, pausing from the work in order to refocus ourselves, reprioritize our life, and then go back into the next week with our priorities straight and our focus set on the goal. It's really a time to- Like yeah. recharging your batteries. Exactly, exactly. Um, that's exactly a perfect example that Shabbat is a time to recharge ourselves physically, right? It's a day of rest. Um, and it's also a time to recharge ourselves spiritually, time to reconnect with God, reconnect with our families, with our children, um, with the people that we love. And, um, you know, the value of Shabbat comes from having just worked six days and being about to go into another work week that I'm pausing. I'm taking this time to, um, you know, take a step back in order to take a giant leap forward. That's the idea of Shabbat. And there's one more daily um, exercise that the Torah gives us. And this is the Mincha prayer. Um, and I'll just explain that in Judaism, we have three prayers. We pray three times a day. So we have the Shacharit prayer, which is the morning prayer, which we usually begin our day. So start off, you wake up um, and we begin our day with the Shacharit prayer. Um, and then we have the Mayrif prayer, just to skip over. We have the night prayer, which is usually said after sunset, um, you know, before going to bed. And the Mincha prayer is the afternoon prayer. So it's smack in the middle of the day, you know, between one and depending on what time sunset is, but between like 
1 and 5 p.m., I guess you can say this prayer. And um, it's actually the most important prayer. And the reason why is based on this idea that to pray in the morning is beautiful because you haven't started your day yet. And it's almost easy because you wake up, you have this new fresh eyes and you're ready to start your day. And it's a perfect time to pray to God. And before you go to bed also, it's a perfect time to pray. You stop, you pause, you reflect on your day and you pray, um, you say a prayer to God. But the Mincha prayer is the most powerful one. And that's because it's in the middle of the day. Um, and you actually, you know, it usually comes up in the most inconvenient times because you're either in the middle of work, you're in the middle of, you know, doing something, it's smack in the middle of the day. And you have to tear, you always usually have to tear yourself away from something in order to say this prayer because it's just always comes up at a busy time. And it's a short prayer, but it's also really powerful because of the timing, because it's afternoon at a time when people are still at work, when a time, a time when people are still busy with daily affairs. And to pull yourself away from that and take a moment to pause and thank God and refocus yourself um, actually makes this prayer the most impactful because you're refocusing yourself in the middle of your day, taking that moment to refocus. What is my goal here? What is my purpose um, to express gratitude to God um, and to, you know, have that moment of mindfulness in the middle of the day um, is more impactful than the other two prayers. So those are just two of Judaism's, you know, practical commandments that help us implement this idea of um, working with purpose, um, working with from a place of I have something to give to the world, I have something to give to others. Um, and my true value, not my true value, my true um, integrity and my true inner strength is expressed in working in being involved in the world in you know, interacting with other people. That's when our true um, nature is really expressed. Um, so I think that this spiritual perspective on work, which like Jane said before, it takes up so much of our life. It really, it occupies so much of our time. And to understand the Jewish perspective on it is really important because it does take up so much of our life and it is a meaningful act. It really is. Like we just explained, it's something that brings us closer to God. It, brings us closer to our purpose. It's something that we almost need inherently to give back and to create new things um, and to feel like we have a purpose and you know we can make a difference in this world because we can. Um, so yeah, that's that's the Jewish perspective, you know. And if anyone has any questions, any comments, any ideas, I guess to wrap up, you know, this just to bring it full circle, the Rebbe's comment to that man where he said, if you have um, experience and success in business, you should use it. And what the Rebbe was really saying is, you know, to let your talent go to waste, right? To sit back and say, I have enough money to support my family, right? The man asked the Rebbe, when is it enough? Like, if I have what I need to support my family, like, is that enough? Should I pull out of my business. And the Rebbe says, no, if you have a talent, you use it, regardless of whether you have enough, right? Because the Rebbe, and at the end, he says, a Jew never has enough or never reaches his goal. There's no one day where you wake up and you say, I've reached my goal. Like, I'm good to go. You know, that doesn't happen according to our Jewish way of life. We're always, work, we're a work in progress. We're always striving. There's always greater and higher heights that we can reach. And so the Rebbe said, there's no one point where you say, I have enough, right? He says, enough is never enough. There's no such thing as enough. We can always reach higher. We can always strive um, to be a little bit better than yesterday. Every day we can say, how can I be just a little bit better today than I was yesterday? And um, in all areas. So yeah, like the idea of like, that spiritually we should always, we should always feel that we don't have enough. But physically and materialistically, we should be content and say we have enough. Right. Yeah. Exactly. I think it's in our. I think it's in, I think it's in our DNA 
to always be striving for for more and to trying to reach greater heights yeah. uh, all the time. You know, uh, it, we wake up and it, it, our, our life hasn't ended. So I think that's the only day of pure, pure rest is when we're, when we're no longer and we'll always keep on working and striving, you know, to reach higher, higher goals. That was right, right, right. But we, but, but like you said, human nature is to always want more, but we need to make that distinction between, you know, spiritually and materialistically. You know, we should be content and happy with what we have materialistically and physically, but we should kind of hone in on that natural tendency to want more and to kind of direct those natural tendencies to uh, spirituality and which is like mitzvot and connection to Hashem, as opposed to wanting more of the physical world, which thank God we're, we're all blessed with. Um, much. Yeah, that was really beautifully said, both Cheryl and Thank you. I don't know who was speaking. But... My mother. It was my mother. It's it's Deanie with a cold. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> I couldn't recognize your voice. Oh. I know. I sound like. Yeah, I know. <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't know who. I I couldn't even match the voice to the person. I know. My apologies. No, not at all.